we now have to do the work, Mr. Danny Farah, who's um, running a very interesting session on pivoting. So we have two great businesses, one powering the on-demand food economy, lots of secret kitchens for um, delivering food, branded food, restaurants names to you directly. It's um, a business, Kitopi, standing for Kitchen Operation Innovations, and it's Mohammed Bayut. And also um, from Vizita, Amir Basum, and um, Vizita is a Biko investment, and it helps you find doctors in Egypt and other things. Mr. Danny Farah. Flip is bizzack, 10 shows a week, I've been so bizzack, y'all been bizzack, taking them selfies in the toilet, shall my mother, I've been out of this. Maybe I'll take this one, or we'll do this too. So David, thank you for the uh, intro to my colleagues. They're actually both portfolio companies of ours, uh, one out of fund one, one out of fund two. Um, so I, I have to do this. When people ask me what Kitopi does, I used to explain it um, the way you did, that they power the uh, on-demand food delivery economy. But I found a far crazier way to describe it. Um, and I'm gonna see, I'm gonna test it on everyone. So they white label food delivery through dark kitchens. Who understands what that means? Show of hands. Wow, we've got a smart audience. Okay, all right. So, um, Mo and I have been friends for about four years through the endeavor. I can see Alan in the crowd. Um, we worked together in a uh, friendly mentoring capacity, if you like, over the last four years. Uh, we're going to tell you a lot about how Hamad has gone from in the last 12 months when we first talked about, actually, it's exactly 12 months. Yeah. November of last, last year, year exactly. when uh, Mo came over and talked about what he was thinking about. And uh, by the way, f forum rules in this, in this room, whatever we talk about stays in this, uh, in this room. We, I'm going to ask some pretty intimate, from a professional perspective, questions. <laughs> um, you can feel free to ignore me and to tell me you don't want to answer, but I'm going to ask some of these questions anyway. So uh, I'll introduce Amir. Amir also... I think we've known each other for about three, four years. I remember when, uh, a little bit like Donna Benton, who came in this morning, I don't know, I'm sure you all had the same type of reaction when you saw her. Within five minutes, you realized this is a special uh, individual who is laser-focused, extremely competitive, and, you know, I can go on and on. I can see a lot of the same attributes that Amir has um, as, as, a, as a CEO, as a founder, and in his business. The, I know I'm not supposed to talk this much, you guys are, but... <laughs> I want to set some context here. This panel is about pivoting, right? Um, so actually, show of hands, from the founders in the room, who's like pivoted, who's never pivoted? Thank God no hands went up. One. <laughs> Another one? Okay. Who's pivoted at least once? Who's probably pivoted? I'm talking about strategy, business model, and probably even business delivery. Who's pivoted five times? Amir's hand went up virtually. Oh, no, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> Amir's trying to measure the crowd. Okay, so clearly it's a topic that's very, very important to us. So the difference between the pivoting journey that uh, we have at Beko witnessed with Mohammed, which has just been wonderful, um, and again, we're gonna be very, very uh, intimate about what we've learned in, about his business uh, is very different to what Amir has learned and, and, and what Amir did from a pivoting perspective. But we're going to try and bring both of you in there. Mo, can you maybe just take a few minutes um, to tell us how you came up with the idea for Kitopi? Uh, so can everyone hear me? Yeah, I think yeah. it's loud. So, uh, so two and a half years ago, I exited uh, my last company. Uh, Danny was uh, an amazing mentor, helped me pull that trigger at the right time. And since then, I thought I'll be an angel investor. Uh, worst decision of my life. And what uh, 
uh, maybe a 12. Arguably the best decision because you end up not doing it. True. 12, 13 months ago, I was about to go do a virtual brand business. I thought it would be an easy way to retire early but have a side business. And then quickly realized that in the food manufacturing space, uh, if you want to go build a chocolate bar, so my last business was a, a chocolate manufacturing business. So if you want to go build a chocolate bar, you'd probably go to a company like the one I just sold. Uh, but if you want to go build a virtual brand, there was no consolidation ever happening. Uh, so I was like, okay, why don't I go build a virtual brand and uh, a kitchen? A friend of mine wanted to build his own virtual brand, and we quickly realized that uh, since there's no consolidation, uh, this is uh, there's a big gap for for this uh, for this idea. So that's kind of how the idea first started. Uh, went to Danny uh, 13 months ago. I was like, Danny, I'm thinking of 12. I think it was November last yeah, year. November last year. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Danny, can we? Uh, we're looking at building kitchens. Uh, what do you think of the idea? We're trying to white label other brands. He's like, you're gonna actually build the kitchens and, and raise capital to keep building kitchens. Uh, and, and keep in mind, I, I, all I understood was brick and mortar and actually owning assets. So I was like, yeah, why not? Let's uh, raise capital and build kitchens. Uh, he uh, thought the idea was good, but just the, maybe the mechanism of how we do it was wrong, was off. I came back again in a couple of months. I was like, okay, Danny, we're going to build the first couple of kitchens. And then after that, we're going to find a smarter way uh, to, to scale up without actually owning the assets. Uh, so we went from there to actually uh, setting up a fund or looking to set up a fund uh, similar to what we work do and, and have that fund build the kitchens for us and quickly realized that it's going to cost us a fortune uh, to service that debt. We're like, okay, so why don't we make brands who work with us pay a one-time fee and that is how we're going to actually own the asset and have someone else pay for it. Uh, and that's where we are as of last month and then uh, as of recently, we're like, okay, there's actually a better model where we still make the brands pay to access our kitchens, except we actually don't have to build the kitchens ourselves. So we partnered with the likes of Travis, uh, who founded Uber, and a few others who they're building. So, I mean, we have six kitchens now. We're going to have over 60 next year, and they're building all our future kitchens. So a transition of going from like an asset-heavy, brick-and-mortar style business to uh, a completely asset-light, highly tech-enabled business was all done in the next, last couple months. So I think what was amazing, ah, oh, that's better, I can hear myself. Um, what was amazing about the transformation and the sort of, you know, zillion micro pivots, forget about the strategy and the business and the financing of the, of the assets and then moving to an asset light model, we're gonna get to all of that in a second. What I find remarkable is, so I've known this guy for four years. He was in the traditional business. He was actually white labeling chocolate baking, right? For yeah. Pachi and you know, those kinds of brands. Um, but when we had our first conversation, even the, 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 the way that you solved for strategy and the way he was constructing his approach to the business, even the vocabulary was very traditional. I don't know if you, does anyone know, does, hands up, who understands what I'm talking about here? Yeah, okay, very few. Okay, maybe not so few. So just the language, right? And now we've been working very closely for, uh, for a year, particularly the first six months, and your, your understanding of the business and the business model and the language that you use as a digital entrepreneur, which really is a very, very different language to a more traditional business and that's much more private equity induced, is I think in and of itself a phenomenal pivot. So I commend you uh, on that. Thanks. Amir, so Amir, the company is called Vizita, and you can tell us what it means and why, but the actual company, as in what you invest in, is called Dr. Bridge. Um, and I remember being a bit taken back by that when we first met. <laughs> and the reason that is, is Amir set out initially, and I'll let you talk about it, to build a different business. He actually was building an EMR uh, and a clinic management software business, selling software to doctors, um, and then pivoted into what Visita is today, which is basically a, an app um, that allows you to book your doctor's appointment. So the open table concept of, uh, uh, for doctors and patients. Amir, can you talk to us about, well, how, what you started off doing, sure. and then how you, what forced you to, to pivot? So um, um, it started when I was, uh, I was working in, uh, in corporate. And I uh, basically uh, realized that there's a huge opportunity in healthcare and uh, 
Um, we realize that everything a healthcare provider is operating in a silo, and um, um, they're not connected to each other, and there's a huge opportunity there. Also seeing the pharma company uh, trying to get their uh, field force and medical reps numbers down, trying to leverage the digital solutions. So the idea was like, let's build something uh, that's basically medical record focused to doctors and healthcare providers, um, and pharma company would come and leverage that for, uh, um, for advertisement and educating the doctors, and we can be billionaires in one or two years. Uh, and uh, that's when it started. I went to um, uh, my boss and told him, I'm, that's, the, that's my plan, and I'm leaving. Um, I remember he, he told me, so how are you going to make money? I told him I'm going to make money out of the doctors, and he told me, okay, you know, we'd say this to a pharma company who would basically laugh out. Uh, uh, and uh, we did it, and uh, uh, we, we actually raised funds very, very early on. And um, I remember when we used to go to the, to the doctors, they used to say, we built a fantastic electronic medical record in eight months, and the doctors used to say to us, uh, when, when they're not adopting it, we're not using it, um, it's our fault, just give me one more month. They were paying, but they were not using it. So it was very clear that there was something wrong in what, uh, in what we're doing. Uh, and um, we start to, to continue uh, changing the uh, different features. And you know, maybe they need specialized uh, uh, medical records. So let's uh, do the dentist part, and let's do the, uh, the guy in a part, and so on. Uh, but it, it was very clear the product in itself wasn't, wasn't picking up right in the, in the market. Um, with time, we start to pivot, and we introduced uh, uh, another concept that we call it patient engagement. It worked, but it didn't really work well. Uh, and actually, that's when Baco. Can I summarize just because I, I love the story, but I remember what the way we got this was you were going out and selling software and EMR to doctors. They were using it. They were paying for it more than they were using it. And when you asked them why they weren't using it more intensely, they pretty much said something to the effect of, which is again, so just getting uh, feedback, is, no, what do you want? And the answer was, actually, we want patience. And, and they, they've got a waiting list of you know, 50 people outside waiting. This is, remember, guys, this is yeah. Cairo, Egypt. And it was confusing to them. You actually want patience, but you've got 50 guys waiting. They just, no matter how many patients you have, you can never have enough. And the second thing was, they wanted some, a medium to help them with digital, a digital presence which is what the app essentially gives them. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, and and uh, you know, interesting story I was just telling you uh, before we get in, there was a, I remember there was a guy that uh, after we opened the Dr. Bridge by two months, literally two months, came to our office and he said, we're doing booking thing to the doctors and um, why don't you acquire us because we can't fundraise? And I said like this and I said, we are in the medical record business. And it, uh, we realized that was super wrong after, after a while. Uh, I guess I, sh I, I owe him a call. Uh, so, <laughs> the, the, uh, yeah, doctors keep on talking about uh, more patients, um, uh, more legion, uh, less on the management side. And we never thought that we'd actually go into, uh, into this business. We didn't want to be a booking platform. We wanted to be the medical data, uh, medical data owner. And it's, uh, that was, the, I would say, one of the biggest, biggest pivots that we have done. Uh, but there's another bigger part of that as well, is how we used to make our model. The model was basically flat fees, uh, where we used to take from the doctor a monthly transcription fees. Just imagine $20 a month or so. Um, and at that time, we just closed around... Um, uh, yeah, well, was it when, when we invested? When, when, when uh, Beko invested and, uh, in the room, Danny and Amir, uh, um, uh, and the, uh, they basically uh, asked me two very important questions. They asked me how we're going to acquire the doctor. I talked about sales, blah, 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 blah. Um, and we talked about the business model, and I hinted on the transaction. Maybe you need to see it. Whatever. And after the investment by 30 days, um, uh, we basically introduced the idea that we're going to transaction. Think that if you go with transaction, what happens to your revenues is that you must go to zero first. Because every single player that you have needs actually to stop paying because you will move from transaction model next day where basically you pay per patient. So we went after the round into to zero. So we invested. Um, we invested. You, you went to the, zero. Yeah, I don't know. My story with Beko is, uh, is, uh, is like, yeah, let's just give me. Uh, so it, we went to zero and then it started to pick up. We, after two months or three months, we went back to our additional revenue part. And after eight months, we doubled. And... Uh, you know, today, the story, the rest is a history. So maybe you can just give people context, uh, whatever you're comfortable sharing with, uh, with the audience, size, dynamics of the business, how, how big 
are you? So, uh, so Visita today operates in uh, in Egypt, Jordan, um, Saudi Arabia. Uh, we are uh, serving around eleven thousand doctors. Uh, we are um, operating on an average um, two hundred and twenty to two hundred and thirty thousand uh, bookings a month. Um, just to give you a little bit of a size, then in 2016, we were 8,000 booking a month. So that's, uh, that's where the, um, the size growth the company is uh, 220 employees, plus or minus. So 100,000 people booked their doctor's appointment through Visita in a month, pretty much. Uh, so basically around 175,000 patients. Patients. 170,000 patients. Okay, so there's the follow-up. Yeah, because there's the follow-up and there's the, uh, yeah. And, and that's predominantly in Cairo. Use, yeah. Uh, and there's um, Jordan and Saudi as well today, yeah. So there's a silver lining, I guess, right, in maybe not even pivoting too quickly. So, you know, if you didn't get uptake with the doctors, you would not have had enough of a customer base to derive the wisdom and the learnings sure. to know what to deliver them. We'll talk about the business model in a second and how you went from subscription to transaction, which I think was uh, scary, certainly on our part, and I'm sure on your part, but it obviously worked out. So, you, you, when you initially thought of the technology stack, so we, we've spent a lot of time uh, and brain power figuring out with Mo what the tech stack looks like. What would you build for? Um, and if you had built the tech stack too quickly, you probably would have been a very, uh, not a very happy camper. Yeah. Can you explain why? So, uh, just, just before that, so I, I, just, I, I recollect a conversation having with another investor who uh, we didn't take money from on month four on our first round, where he said, well, you're not a tech company. And we're like, look, if we build something now, we're just gonna throw it away. We're gonna build the following, but we're just now in learning mode. And he said, no, but you're not a tech company. Uh, uh, we, we, uh, we ended up not taking their money, but then uh, obviously we learned really fast of what we don't want. I remember having a great conversation with one of your LPs, Rashid Rashid, uh, where we like, look, this is what we're trying to do. I mean, he's an operator, he's an investor, he understands the whole, like, this is what we're trying to do from a tech stack, what do you think? And he really challenged uh, one of the elements, which is us building a, a point of sale system. He's like, but look, I'm sure if you work really hard with one of the POS providers, you can actually tailor make something why don't you focus on what is the actual innovation element of things, where you can actually build IP on? Uh, so yeah, so since then, uh, we quickly realized what we, what we were building is more uh, the platform and where we can gain the most efficiencies on the back end. Uh, so yeah, so timing of what to build was important, and, uh, and we're being really aggressive on, on building uh, the whole tech stack now. Do you want to talk a little bit about the sort of the... <laughs> I can hear cheeky laughs in the crowd. Do you want to talk a little bit about how, how the product has transformed from a stack perspective vis-a-vis -vis if you had built it four months ago till today? Maybe more on the connect side. Yeah, so initially... And the, and the underutilization of assets. Uh, so initially... We're, we, trying to, we're trying to lace the question here so that he gets it, but maybe you don't so much. So initially we thought, let's build a point of sale system, uh, focus just back end, and uh, with time, we quickly realized actually the front end is what's really important, especially as uh, we're about to add you know, a consumer-facing element to what we do. And a couple of months ago, uh, we came up with an idea called Kitopi Connect. Uh, so what we do predominantly now is we cook and deliver on behalf of brands. We have multiple units we operate out of. And uh, a couple of months ago, we launched a, a new service, a new product called Kitopi Connect. And what we do there is we uh, integrate with all the restaurants uh, which are underutilized, which are 99.9% of .9 restaurants uh, in the world. And we work with them on using their resource and their infrastructure to cook on our behalf. And so having, building the platform that links our brands to us, to them, is where we see the most value versus building a point of sale system which, uh, which would have been would, a waste of money for sure. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, let's shift gears and talk a little bit about pivoting in the way you do business. Uh, Amir, I know you have a lot to say about that. Maybe you can also speak specifically. I think it's a great one that um, he's about to share with us from a, your hiring uh, policy. Yeah. I, I think there was, uh, whenever I hear the word pivoting about, uh, about startups, I remember a, a statement that was, uh, was said in a, in, a, in a trip that I, that I had in the Valley going 
uh, to visit some companies there. And uh, it's basically says corporate execute startups search. Um, and that's very true. I think uh, the role of a startup is not actually to think that they are in execution mode. Obviously, at one point of time, they are. But we are, I think we're in a, in a continuous, non-stop mode of searching for what's the best way, what's the best product, best business model, best pricing, best sales way, best hiring, uh, best marketing, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, so for example, um, I would always consider myself a, a lousy in, in, in hiring. Um, I, I, I did a terrible job on that. Every single time we get a, uh, we get a hire, we realize that's a, not a good hire, um, or there's not a, a culture fit like uh, uh, Tara was talking, and it's uh, the best way we realize that this could work is actually we'll do something, we call it engagement days. So we'll invite the hires uh, to stay at our office for, uh, for three days. Um, and, um, and the idea for that, by the way, it started at seven days, and we realized seven days is too long. We did it one day, we realized that one day is too short, and then we start now to do it as, uh, as two days uh, plus three days. This is basically, we get him uh, um, uh, on board, and we tell him, you basically act as your, uh, as your role. Um, and the way we do it is basically we tell him, I think you need to interview us as well as we interview you, because you also need to make sure that this is what you want to do. Uh, think about getting someone working from Procter & Gamble or, or Glaxo or, uh, uh, or corporates and come to work for a startup. It's literally a new world. It's a different world. It's different how uh, you, do, you do life. Um, and they have to pivot themselves. Absolutely. Uh, the, this, the unlearn, learn thing um, is, is just massive. How do you do that with senior leadership? So you hire, give us your Saudi example. Uh, so <laughs> we have, um, I think we actually have one of the examples here now. We have uh, um, Maha Melham just joined us as the, uh, as the VP of growth. She's, uh, she used to, uh, we used to be peers in, um, in AstraZeneca. Um, and I think the, the way we do it is uh, um, she basically, uh, after the engagement day, the way she's basically onboarded is basically we don't give clear assignment in the first two to three months. Um, and we try to pass all um, valuable or invaluable connections, uh, meetings. And uh, uh, so, you know, she is, she has met in the last four days uh, companies that are talking to us uh, for us to, to acquire or to merge. Uh, uh, companies that are thinking of uh, sending us their technology so we can integrate with ours. Um, and most of the, these companies, she was just telling me, uh, are you throwing garbage in? Is this just, uh, are we really getting something out of it? I was like, the reality is no. Some of them could actually end up in something. But I think the learning when you see these things, that what I have been through, and that when, you, uh, when you get through this will actually uh, pick up there. That's uh, one of the ways of, uh, of doing it. But let's say you're hiring a GM for Saudi. We uh, basically get them in, in our office and we tell them uh, that's the engagement process. So you fly them in from Saudi. We fly them into in Cairo. from Saudi. Uh, uh, we uh, ask them to stay with us for two, three days. Uh, we give them an office and tell them today you are the GM of Saudi for the coming three days. Do whatever you want. Every single body in the company knows that you're here. Every single body in the company is ready to share a particular set of data. Um, so we have this quite structured, uh, a particular set of data. Um, they literally go around, meet um, every single person in the company they want to meet. We don't even arrange who they are supposed to meet. Obviously, we do some arrangement and some uh, clear uh, set of meetings to guide them through. Um, and it's phenomenal because it, it really tells you who can uh, get himself dirty into the business, who can really uh, get off the corporate mindset, which is not necessarily bad, but it necessarily doesn't fit. So uh, uh, you need them to really be the startup mentality, and, the, uh, and you see that in action. And also he sees us in action, so he could actually think that you are, uh, so most of them were quite astonished by the size of data that we are using in our day-to-day -day job. Um, some of them were very, very surprised with the quality of talent. Some of them were very uh, uh, negatively surprised by uh, the size of chaos, um, and so on and so forth. So, Okay, maybe this is not quite pivot, but just walk us through your, your view of the world, your vision. Your, so when we got involved in uh, Visita, what excited us was the concept of you build something at the core that you own extremely well, and in this case it's 
uh, doctor patient platform, booking platform. And then ultimately, if you really want to build something that's really cool, uh, massively valuable, and makes a massive impact to all the stakeholders in it, is you use that core to then build out the connective tissue to the rest of the, uh, of the ecosystem. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Because we, sure. we spend uh, board meetings and uh, sleepless nights talking about these things. Um. You know, we used to draw our, uh, what is our strategy? We used to put patients and doctors in the middle, and then we start putting the different stakeholders around it. I think it's very clear for us now, uh, not, not because of the less of an important, but it's very clear now we are a company that is empowering patients, and we put them in the center, and all other stakeholders uh, are around. And that's how we basically, uh, we, we can see the, the evolution of Visita um, um, in the future. I think it's, uh, one is, um, how to see what are the pain points that the patient is going through, and what is the quantitative value of this pain in his, in his life cycle. So he has pains in visiting doctors, but how many times a year he does that? How many, um, uh, he has pains in going to a hospital, how many times he's doing that? And uh, the size of the pain uh, and, the, and the quantity of the pain, so volume and value, uh, is actually the identifier of what you should do, you should do next to uh, to fix this problem. So we started by the doctor's relation. We moved into the hospital um, integration. Uh, we uh, we now into the diagnostics, where we do integration with the different diagnostic players, and actually going back again to the medical record uh, thing, availing it to the, to the patients, obviously, with all the uh, security-related things. Um, and again, um, thinking about whether telehealth has a, has a value, whether uh, um, uh, all the different remote health has a value or the region is ready for it or not, thinking about uh, medication and, and all of these things. So that's how uh, we, th we see it. Patients in the middle, and we keep on adding different value uh, to them until they, their life cycle in accessing health care um, is quite improved. If you go back in time, I think uh, founders obviously are running and sprinting at a thousand kilometers an hour, so you rarely have time to take stock, sit there and look back at where you came from. What a ride. You're in a very, very hot space. How, you know, what do you think when you look back on the, the beginning from a thinking perspective of what you wanted to do and how it's transpired to today? And I guess if you can extend that out to give people a feeling for, you know, what's your vision for your sector without giving it a name because it could it could morph i mean we're 10 months old so i think uh in terms of me taking time to reflect on what happened I mean, it's been a crazy 10 months uh we're about to branch out uh, we said so abu dhabi is going live next week we're going to be in london uh, new york singapore next year so it's a uh, did you did you even think that th this would be the case 10 months ago we, little we, 12 months ago no definitely we didn't think it's we gonna, certainly didn't it's going to scale this fast uh, so the whole vision is, is changing, uh, you know, obviously we're, it's, it's becoming just a much bigger vision uh, every month. But the whole idea is just really changing the food landscape as we know it. Uh, we initially thought it'll, it'll help people save on CapEx, it then moved to actually making brands. Imagine like we, we, what we're telling brands now is you can be a brand in any, a food brand in anywhere across the world. Uh, and in 2019 we can put you in five global cities. Uh, at zero cost. You can scale up across five global cities uh, and go online uh, without actually having to have any resource on the ground. So it's, uh, it's completely changing the franchise industry, completely changing how uh, you know, food brands think of scale. We talked to a lot of ma massive conglomerates who used to, so Maj and uh, a lot of ma massive brands globally, who think, uh, who are completely changing their strategy of um, how they're tackling the on-demand food economy now. So I think we're, you know, timing is really uh, on our side now, um, and yeah, the vision is just absolutely massive, and it's not just linked to uh, one particular vertical in food, but we're thinking there's so much more we can actually go for. We'll, we'll leave it at that. We'll keep it very high level, uh, given the nature of the, uh, of the audience. Okay, um, I'm gonna stop bringing you folks in. If you have any questions, please raise your hands and raise them so that we can see them and get a microphone uh, to you. There's one. It's planted. <laughs> Hi. 
Okay, thanks guys. Um, quick question to both of you, but maybe start with Mo. How, you've pivoted a lot of times since we've met you and before we've met you. How do you keep, what is the right balance between uh, pivoting um, versus, you know, stay, when do you pull the plug and, you know, change course versus, no, let me, let me further try and, and keep going, I, I might, I might hit, hit oil. I think the right thing is to actually test something and test it really fast. So uh, maybe I'll give it through an example. So uh, we had a, a chat with um, one of my partner's brothers, so Rabi Ataya of Beit, and, and he came up with this uh, idea. He's like, why don't you use underutilized kitchens? And he, he then went all over the place with ideas, and, and then it just struck something, and he came out of the meeting, we're like, look, let's just test it um, you know, with one kitchen and see how dynamics work. And just before testing it, I, I spoke to Danny. I was like, Danny, what do you think of you know, this kind of direction? Uh, I saw a spark. I was like, okay, so I, I think there's something there. Uh, so one week after, we were live in kitchen one. It did really well, and, and now we're live with five. And so I do think testing, um, you know, doing a, a silo test somewhere, but then moving really fast if it actually works. That's where we're at in 10 months. So. Amir, uh, just a, a question to you, because I think so. Uh, Mohammed's pivots were going deeper down into the same business that he's in and, and, in, and just a, a tweaks and adjustments. But you made a major pivot and a huge shift that's probably taken a lot of thought. So how did you do that exercise? How did you come to the exercise? Is, okay, that's a huge, I'm gonna shut this down and, and head into a completely different uh, horizontal shift. I think it has also to do with the, with the industry itself. Uh, one of the things that we realize that healthcare is a, is a very, very uh, different animal uh, than other industries. That has to do with the nature of the uh, healthcare providers, that uh, uh, the availability and the worthness of the time, and the, uh, as well as the sensitivity of consumers or patients handling, uh, handling such industry. Uh, so having said so, if we think about it, we, our objective was actually end it, the strategy if you think about the top level strategy it, it never changed you we want to use technology products to improve access to healthcare to to patients um, um, that ends up in giving them data that ends up giving them empowerment on how to choose what to choose and we thought that the the thing that's missing is the electronic medical record if it doesn't work so let's see something else so we kept on trying to get into the industry we always think that this industry needs a door and we were looking for the door not looking actually what we're going to do inside the house uh, so that's why we were actually quite um, uh, mobile in what we would do and what we would not do um, to, to get into, the, into that house. I actually think it was a competitive advantage because if they had tried to build as others have in the region, by the way, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, there's probably 20 companies that came to the market, yeah. and some are still around, most, most aren't, that do pay, uh, doctor patient booking across the region, right? Across, at least across the, the, the key markets. But I think in hindsight, one of the things we really liked about Emir and the team, forget about the team, uh, but the way that they had, not by design, by mistake, stumbled across this Trojan horse, which was, let's go sell doctors something that we thought they needed. It was cute, they needed it. It was, sorry, I, I don't mean any disrespect, but you know, it was like Panadol, but I really, yeah. what I need is uh, my, my horrible analogy, but uh, yeah, I won't even use it, but anyway, it, maybe it's not appropriate, yeah. Um, but. And if you weren't in the, the, the doctor's share of wallet, because they were paying for this, and you didn't have those relationships, uh, you would not have been able to have that conversation. And so you would not have been able to have the insight to make the pivot into uh, adding the, the consumer-facing app, which allowed then patient to book the doctor and give the doctor what they wanted, which was, I want patients and I want a digital presence. That's ultimately what this product gives them. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think the same thing with you. I mean, maybe I, I can share uh, our journey. When we first spoke to Mo, one of the things that uh, we didn't like was the traditionalness, if I can use that word, about the, the business that he initially conceived of, right? White labeling food. Um, and, you know, if you, you think about... It, so the way he went about responding to us was, yeah, whatever. Uh, but yeah, okay, I'll come back. And he came back with... 
you know, a much more technologified, again, I'm making up this word, I don't know if it exists, but whatever, at least you understand what I'm trying to say, um, proposition, and, and really constructively was trying to use technology to, to, solve, to, to, to solve a massive problem, but it wasn't what the problem he's solving today. It was just, he, he wouldn't, it, he, that was his Trojan horse. But ultimately what Mo did was, screw you, I'm gonna go do this anyway. And he went and, because he could, funded it and you know, built a kitchen and started doing it. And then we said, my God, um, okay, let's have a discussion. And then you know, from one brand, because actually when we first talked to brands about it and said, would you let somebody make your food and have it delivered to a, to a consumer? Most people actually said no. Probably including myself, if I'm honest, right? Let's be very frank about this. Just last week, actually a few days ago, I was telling some of my colleagues that I have, I, I was in the food and beverage Danny, business myself. Danny, Danny sorry. Tell yeah, me I'm not a panelist. Here. Yeah, please, please. <laughs> it's, I'm just reinforcing how the, the Trojan horse it, it doesn't matter enabled enough, them so. to pivot. <laughs> Go ahead, that's all yours. <laughs> okay, you whatever. We're having fun, yeah. Danny. Go ahead. Huh? Go ahead. <laughs> We love you. Do you have a you? question, Amin? I do have a question. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> so we have so, sometimes founders find themselves in a position where they've got uncertainty with the current path, and changing direction is sometimes a very difficult decision. Uh, like having conviction on whether to pivot, right? So what is the? How do you build conviction as a founder when people are investing in you with one story, and then you have to change that story? And so. But since he cut me off, I'm going to finish my sentence. Jesus Christ. So I, have a couple, I have lots of friends in the food and beverage industry Sorry, that's who, I, who I actually asked you know, months ago. They thought I was insane. And guess what? Just a few days ago, they were both like, oh, I'd love to be on the platform. So anyway, that's a Trojan horse. Uh, Shall I repeat my question since Danny interrupted or you got it? Go ahead. Did you, do you want Conviction. To Conviction on whether, like, when you're on that path, it, you tell a story, you're going down that path, and suddenly you figure out something else, but how do you build conviction to make sure you go all in on that direction? So conviction to, to the investors, to, or you to don't yourself, tell them? That's to, the, yourself, <laughs> to yourself. To yourself. Then, you fake it. <laughs> no, no, we have discussions openly with founders, so we, we're open to those discussions. So I'm just saying, like, from, from a founder perspective, it's all about you going all in on that strategy, right? Yeah. So I do think, I mean, I, in my case, I'm lucky. We have uh, two amazing co-founders who uh, we keep bouncing ideas and, and and uh, when it resonates with all of us, we kind of move ahead with this uh, idea. So I, I do think we, we test really fast uh, and then we can execute even faster. So that's kind of what works for us. So if it feels right and, and like we, we, you know, and data comes back that actually this works, uh, a week after it's, you know, we're doing it. So I so guess that's like a mix of like, you know, conviction within, you know, a group and, uh, and then testing the whole idea of making, making work. How have you changed the way you take on brands? Danny, that was my question, sorry. Uh, Amir, do you have an answer? Sorry, I didn't, I'm just uh, stopping. <laughs> I would actually use the word the fake here. I think, I, I, I know, I, I, I hate investors who would hear that or even uh, the a team of the company, but at the point of time, you, you actually need to fake conviction until it proves right. Um, sometimes you, Sometimes you only know that what's in hand is not the great path that you want to end up doing. So you know what? What are you going to lose? I will, I will take the leap of faith and, and take it, and you just fake it to, uh, to everybody around you until they believe it. Uh, and actually, while you're doing so, you are actually improvising it. Because when you keep on telling the story, and this story is not sellable. I need to, so I need to fix this point. I need to fix this point accordingly. So I think that's how... So use data, fake it. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> I do, fake it fake it to make it. I do think there's an important point as well to add that asking too many people for their opinion is also a problem. And, um, yeah. and one, one thing we got into a trap on is actually taking a lot of people's opinion and what they think of something. I do think like having a close you know, and a couple of people you really trust their advice, sounding board, and, and you as co-founders uh, making a call, like, that's good what's working for us. Uh, very quick comment on, on this because I think that's uh, very important. I think uh, uh, we st every single time we used to ask most of the people around how we should go to market, everybody, like literally everybody said, do not invest except on digital platforms. And we kept on doing so for years and then we said, you know what, it is just too expensive. And we tried other paths and 
I would, I would claim that Visita has made a move in, in Egypt particularly on teaching the market that you could actually use offline markets to generate much better return on investment than uh, your, digital, your digital parts. So you talk about out, outdoor? Yeah, which is basically not asking a, a lot of people because experience is different between uh, one play and another. Hello, this is uh, Mustafa from Cairo. Uh, I'm co-founder of uh, Breadfast. And what we do at Breadfast is that we deliver fresh bread and breakfast items to customers' doorsteps every morning using a mobile app. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm very convinced that uh, pivoting is one of the main gates to build the product market fit. And uh, it is very, very important. But the word fast is a bit tricky. So I want to know from you, Danny, like uh, from an investor uh, perspective, how fast uh, it should be, also from a founder perspective, uh, either Mohammed or Amir, because like in Mohammed's case, it was very fast, I guess, right? And at Amir's case, it took a bit of time, so how fast it should be? Wow, that's a, it's a difficult question to ask in, in the abstract, or at least to answer. So I think, look, you have two examples here of how it, it, they're very, very different in different scenarios. In one case, when you're going into no man's land and you're innovating uh, in a space that really no one's ever done this before, right? If you look around the globe, he's actually going into a white space. Um, how quickly do you need to pivot? I think in, when you're innovating, you need to pivot like crazy because there's so much you don't know. Um, when you're in a business where you know, there are comparables, you can sort of get your head around what's worked in other places, obviously copying someone else is not the best use of one's time. So I'm not suggesting you do that, but at least you derive inspiration, particularly from similar markets, emerging markets, as to how you sort solve certain problems. To be honest with you, I think uh, you know, Amir should be a role model for many other emerging market uh, platforms that do what they do to come and see how they've cracked it, because they, they have, and we've seen very little in the way of companies that do what he does that have actually cracked it without having gone down his path by accident. So that's sort of my investor response. I don't know if you guys have anything yeah. you'd like to add. I, I have a, you know, I think there are two parts of this. The first one is identifying that you need to pivot. That could take time. How long do you need to pivot? I think that it's one hour, literally. Go with bad product that's not ready, it doesn't matter. Just uh, if you decide it, uh, if, you, the, if it is a stage one is done, just jump in. Uh, that's, how, that's how we've done it, and that's the, our experience ended up that this is working really well. Obviously, identifying that it, uh, whether you need to pivot or not, that could take time, it could not. It really depends on your conviction and, the, and what's happening and the KPIs that you're gathering from the market. Yeah. No, what, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I do think, uh, I completely agree. I do think uh, moving fast, I mean, we don't know except how to move fast. I don't think uh, we would know how to think too much about something, but... Uh, but yeah, I do think first part, it's, it's, it's when you're convinced that this is something you want to do and leaving ego out of that decision, like if you're actually really convinced and it makes sense, uh, executing it really fast before someone else does is what worked for us. Maybe I could just add again to that. So um, in Hamad's case particularly, because he's going into a space that you know, no man's ever been before or very few people have done it around the world, um, what was amazing about the rate of change of pivoting was even when we would push Mo to think in a certain way about a certain problem, he was doing the same thing on five other things. And we weren't having these conversations with him. He'd come to us pretty much at the end and say, you know, I've got this. What do you think of this? I'm like, ooh, never even thought of that. That's really cool, right? So, but again, I think it just depends on the kind of business that you're, you're in and, and uh, um, you yeah. adapt from there. I, we're out of time. Is there any last burning incredible question that we just absolutely have to ask? It's going to be a good one. If it's not, I'm going to shoot you down. There's one at the back there. Okay. Put you on a lot of pressure. It's going to be good. Thank you. Uh, Khaldun from Kareem. Um, I have a question for you, uh, Muhammad. Can you let us know um, what's it like fundraising for such a white label idea? You know, like the fact that you might walk into a room full of investors and pitch this really white label idea that doesn't have a proven concept outside of the Middle East, what's it like? How, like? What do you go through? How do you prepare for this? How long does it take you to explain the idea to those investors? 
I hope that lived up to your standards, Danny. That's an awesome question from Kareem, of course. Uh, yeah, look, I do think it's, it was always a challenge to kind of explain what we do. Danny does it better than I do any day of the year. Uh, so it's, it was always a challenge. We, we got really good at it, saying it like 300 times, and, uh, and people do understand really fast what we do. I do think the food space has evolved a lot. Uh, the investors we talk to understand food, uh, so that helps. And, um, and I do think the fact that we're first movers is to our advantage because uh, explaining to someone how we want to move to London and New York and not Saudi and Kuwait uh, now makes sense. So, uh, and, and we've been fortunate. We were you know, oversubscribed on both rounds and, and we've been having it lucky so far. Uh, so we just need to execute everything we've been uh, promising on. So the coolest thing about this, in Mo's case, since you asked the question specifically about Mo, is and we're seeing this a lot more in the, in the evolution of the ecosystem, particularly in our, in our uh, latest fund, is when, you know, I think three quarters of the, of the seven companies we've invested in are obviously Dubai or regional based, primarily Dubai, and they're actually building stuff and going into white spaces that really no one's gone into. Now, if these guys and girls, mostly guys, unfortunately, but you know, guys and girls, get it right, this is huge, right? This is a five to $10 billion outcome. It's not just a billion dollar outcome, which would still in and of itself be a phenomenal outcome for all the stakeholders concerned and for the ecosystem and for you guys as founders. Everyone would make a crazy amount of money and would make a crazy, a crazy impact. What I will say in closing is as follows, is today is obviously about learning um, from what we talk about on stage, but it's also about um, supporting each other in the ecosystem, not just us supporting you guys, you guys supporting each other, so please, Meet people you don't know. Don't go and find people that you know and sit in your comfort zones. Talk to not just these folks. Talk to each other. Do deals. Buy from each other. Sell to each other. And maybe, who knows, you know, buy one another. So, you know, if we can facilitate M&A down the line, it'd be awesome. Kareem's in the house and they're buying. <laughs> that was exciting. I got a question for Danny. <laughs> Quick question. From the investment point of view, most investors want to know what they're buying. They want to know what the business model is, which direction it's going, one year, two year, three year plan. But you seem more enticed by adaptable, curious individuals. Is that an active decision you're making, looking for people who don't have that certainty? I think we only invest in, in people and amazing people. I know it sounds like a bit of a cliche. It's uh, one that pains me to actually say uh, and repeat, but it's all about the, the people. The thing is, we've gotten used to, given the first wave of the ecosystem, investing in companies that are solving for problems that are pretty much regional and that we've seen succeed elsewhere, right? So you almost de-risked it from a, from a model perspective. It's now team and execution. Now we're moving into version 2.0, just like China and India and a lot of other economies Latin America are doing right now, where they're actually innovating, not just localizing, actually innovating for, the, for their region and, and maybe even beyond borders. And in that case, you really only have the founders uh, to back. By the way, I think it makes it a lot easier to be very fair when you're backing uh, entrepreneurs, particularly like Mo, who's a second-time entrepreneur. I mean, he, he had a very, very successful exit of his... Um, chocolate white labeling business. So from an execution perspective, it makes it a lot, a lot easier. Great panel. Thank you, Danny. We'll Thank get you. more of you a bit later.